Good morning, OFH. It's Pastor Jay and Katie. Good morning. We are here to get things kicked off today. And before we get started and into worship, we just wanted to pray over this service. So okay. would you start? Yep. Okay. Father, we thank you for today. And before we do anything else, we want to welcome you, Holy Spirit, to be present in our homes 
to be present with us as we're watching and listening. We need you more than ever. We need your wisdom. We need your mercy. We need your grace. And we need your peace. We thank you that you are with us today and every day. Lord, let all that we do today honor you. We thank you, Father, for your, your grace. We thank you for peace in the midst of trying times. Lord, we thank you for your body, which is dispersed right now, Lord. We thank you that we get to come together right now, Lord, and seek to honor you. We ask for your presence to invade the spaces we are in, Lord. We are united by your spirit. And so we, can't say, hum, come, we say, come, Holy Spirit, come right now. Wherever we are right now, come Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the work you're doing in each one of us right now. And Lord, we thank you that you're victorious over all the challenges that we see in the earth, all the trials, all the tribulations, everything, Lord. We know you already have the victory. So we focus our eyes on you right now, Jesus. And we say, come to the glory of our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to head off into worship now with Lee, and then after that, we'll be back for some announcements. We'll see you then. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor. Would you join me this morning as we uh, proceed into worship? Cross. I never know how much 
such an honor this morning to be able to lead in worship. Um, this is a, a difficult season. Uh, a lot of people are struggling uh, just with the isolation and the separation from people. Um, a friend of mine recently posted uh, on Facebook that everyone she knows, all of her close friends, are struggling with trauma uh, of some sort. Uh, many of them uh, multiple areas of trauma. So this morning, as as we proceed into worship, it's my desire just to lead us into a place of connection with the Lord. Um, just a time of, of just being able to surrender to Him, to realize that He's here, uh, that we're not alone, that He's with us. So please join me. Before I need you more 
I need you more, more than the air, more than the air I breathe, more than the song I sing, more than the next heartbeat, more than anything, and Lord, as time goes by, I'll be by your side. Never want to go back to my old life. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say. I need you more. Never before I need you more 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 Close to you, never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. No one else will do Cause nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you Draw me close to you Never let me go
never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire Nothing else can take your place Can feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you is the
is my daily prayer This is my daily prayer Your very word Spoken to me And I I'm desperate for is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living This is my daily prayer This is my daily prayer Your very word Spoken to me Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you, Lord, every breath that I take, every moment I Every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire. Oh,
so much that that your love and your kindness is always there for us that you desire us more than we desire you come Lord come Lord permeate each home that's represented here bind us together Lord, we miss each other so much. i 
is around us. Hear our cries, Lord. Let them rise. Open up the skies of mercy. Rain down the cleansing flood. Healing. Hear our cries, Lord, let them rise. It's your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance. Your favor, Lord, is our desire. It's your beauty, Lord, that makes us stand in silence. And your love, your love is better than life. I'll let your mercy fall, Lord. We can feel your mercy falling you are turning our hearts back again hear our praises rise to heaven draw us near Lord meet us here it's your kindness Lord that leads us to repentance your favor lord is our desire it's your beauty lord that makes us stand in silence and your love your love it's your Leads us to repentance. Your favor, Lord, is our desire. It's your beauty, Lord, that makes us stand in silence. And your love, your love, is better than. Oh, better than life. Better than life. Yes, better than life. It's your kindness, Lord. Leads us to repentance. Your favor, Lord, is our desire. It's your beauty, Lord, that makes us stand in silence. And your love, your love is better than life. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness. We thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, welcome back. And thank you, Lee, for leading us in worship today. Well, if you're just joining us or you started joining us during worship, I'm Pastor Jay Patterson. This is my wife, Katie. 
And welcome to our Father's House this morning. We're here to welcome you and give you a few announcements before we get into the message today. Yep, we're going to keep this short and sweet. First of all, as always, if you have a prophetic word to send off to us, please go ahead and do so to the number on the screen. We had a couple scriptures come in last week. Um, we had a prophetic word, and it's really um, encouraging to see how the Holy Spirit is speaking to you all during this time and how it aligns with what he's also speaking to us. So if you have one, please go ahead and share it tomorrow at, lo- or at noon. We will be doing another Facebook Live. We will um, come to you guys live at noon. We will pray with you. We will share any words. We will share what's on our heart. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all there. And if you can't watch it live, please check it out afterwards. Yeah. And if you would like to give to our Father's House, you can either give through our Give Plus app or go to our website and give through Vanco. I just wanted to say we've got a lot of weather coming up this week. It looks like in the forecast there may be a hurricane that sideswipes us here. So please stay safe and be praying for our area, uh, that people don't have power going out, uh, that there's protection over our homes and over the lives of the people living here, and also for any areas that are affected. I'd encourage you to be praying for them and for the emergency responders, for the hospitals, for the the leaders and governors in those areas, that they would be equipped to do uh, what they need to to take care of their people. So... uh, Without further ado, though, I would like to introduce Pastor Lanny. He has the message this week, and we're excited about what he's bringing. He's going to be speaking some wisdom into this season. So, yeah. over to you, Pastor Lanny. Good morning, and welcome to the ongoing saga of virtual church. As we have been looking at our nation and the chaos that has ensued, in these last months, it's pretty obvious that we are in an atypical time. And as I've watched the talking heads and seen the videos of street riots and listened to some of the uh, Christians that I regard and others I hardly even know, I feel compelled to address a subject that is not typically spoken about with any real clarity. Today, I wanna talk to us about the concept of emotional salvation. It shouldn't surprise us when people who are of darkened mind do do works of darkness. It's consistent with what the scripture speaks about the, the ignorance that is within them. But it should trouble us a little bit when those who call themselves the followers of Christ get taken captive in their emotions and begin to thoughtlessly agree with or participate in things that are basically antithetical to what it means to be a follower of Christ. I want to let the Apostle Paul remind us of a couple of contrasts, things that should be actually visible between the followers of Jesus and those who are yet unreconciled to the Father, but for whom Jesus Christ also died. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul makes these comments. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you no longer walk as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus. And in reference to your former manner of life, You lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. That is, deceit, which causes someone to have a misleading or erroneous view when it concerns the truth. But lay aside your former manner of life, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. As those who are committed to the truth, it is incumbent upon us to not only acknowledge the authority of Scripture, but to accept 
the authority over our lives. So frequently I run into Christians who, yeah, I know the word of God is true, but I exclude this portion of the word from being applicable to my life. This becomes contradictory in both the, that which is spoken and that which they walk out. Another contrast Paul offers is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, when he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Those things exist in the world, and you know they do, because such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. Now, these, these contrasts that Paul is highlighting in these two passages of Scripture revolve around the issue of salvation. And when we speak about salvation, the Scripture uses broad sweeping terms in um, communicating to us the benefits of the salvific um, life and death of Jesus. For instance, when the scripture talks about the new birth, it speaks of us being made alive in Christ. When it uses the word justification, that concerns our legal standing with God because of the atonement of Christ. Redemption is another word with a reference to salvation. It means the payment of the price to bring one back to God. Reconciliation is the word used to describe the um, change in relationship between where we were dead in the spirit and now reconciled to life in the spirit to the Father. And propitiation is that word which communicates the turning away of God's wrath from us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now that's those biblical terms are, 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 are theological backdrop to the personal experience of reconciliation to God that we, that we experience when we confess our sins and come to Christ. Now, my salvation experience was uh, very emotional. I'd been in the church since uh, two weeks old, basically. But I didn't get born again until I was 16. On a particular night, it had it was one of those times when it was like the preacher was preaching directly to me. And I went from being a good religious boy to a born again teenager in a matter of seconds. But the experience was highly emotional. I wept uncontrollably. I could hardly see to drive home. My, my father didn't know what to do with me, but grabbed me by the army, take me into my bedroom where I knelt and wept and prayed for I don't know how long. And for days, I had this sense of inner cleansing. It was as if I had been whitewashed on the inside. I, I saw everything differently. Now, when I speak about an emotional salvation, I'm not talking about the salvation of our emotions. Those are two different things. There are those who come to Christ, they have their moment of reconciliation, and it's very matter of fact, there's no emotion involved at all. So I'm using my personal testimony to contrast the issue I'm trying to deal with, which is the salvation of our emotions, not emotional salvation experience. In the um, creation, it's important to remember that we are created as the image and as the likeness of God the Father. Uh, Paul addresses the elements of our triune God creating a triune entity when he says in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, entirely, that is completely, totally, everything about you. And he goes on to say, May your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when, when I speak about this, generally I, I paraphrase Paul in this fashion, that we are a spirit being who possesses a soul and lives in a body. Now, 
when the soul is referenced in many uh, writ written ways and spoken ways, we talk about the soul be the, being the seat of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, sanctified <clears throat> means to bring, set apart into a place of holiness and purity. And he says this about our complete being. The scripture often speaks about us being renewed in the spirit of our mind. Uh, elsewhere, we're told that our body is the, bo is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you and that you're no longer your, your, your own. So glorify God in your body. So we think we see the, the spirit of the mind and the body being addressed directly. However, our emotional life is intrinsic to the operation of our soul. Now, there's a very fascinating book written by uh, Matthew Elliott entitled Faithful Feelings, Rethinking Emotion in the New Testament. And he goes through uh, to take a look at the emotional dynamics of the New Testament and how they affect the way we as human beings respond to God and to one another. Eliot proposes two theories of emotions. The cognitive theory of emotions argues that reason and emotion are interdependent. The non-cognitive theory promotes the separation of reason and emotion. Functionally, we know they're not separated. Um, the cognitive theory states that we get emotionable, emotional about the things we feel about strongly. Our emotions are neither random nor unexplained. <coughs> Excuse me. They are not mere physiology. If the cognitive theory is correct, emotions become an integral part of our reason and our ethics in forming and reinforcing moral behavior. Now, the fact that we are emotional creatures requires some attention. Um, there was a... Uh, a broadcast dealing with children out of control, where you watch 10, 11 year old children just violently and abusively curse out their parents. This is an example of no restraint being applied in the development of the child because we make excuses for their behavior rather than correcting their behavior. The difficulty with that is as they mature, they don't mature emotionally. Chronologically, they grow older, but they're never taught how to rein in their emotions. Proverbs says that a man who cannot rule over his own emotions is like a city without walls. So the emotional development of a child and the recapturing of the neglected emotional development in adults becomes very, very important when we're talking about bringing people into healing. My, uh, my spiritual father, when he was in law school, was part of a team of students who were charged with looking at decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States. And their conclusion was every decision in every case that they reviewed was an emotional decision. So if emotions play this strong a role in our thinking and our actions, even in our application of scripture, what are we to do in processing this thing I'm calling emotional salvation? Well, as always, we who are followers of Christ have to look to Jesus as our model. So I want to point out some things, highlight some, just take a little helicopter ride, sit down in a few places over his life and ministry to take a look at how Jesus managed his emotional life. First of all, I want to begin in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus makes the declaration of who he represents. Now, he's in his own hometown and he's reading out of Isaiah where the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to bring sight to the blind to free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and he closes the scroll and he says in his own hometown synagogue this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing that is he is standing up to publicly identify with the fact that he represents the Father. Now, in this discourse he's having in the synagogue, he moves on to say some other things to which <coughs> the crowd reacts. <coughs> the record of the scripture in Luke chapter 4 shows that the audience that was listening moved from this disposition. All were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. 
They went from that to saying, now, wait a minute. This is Joseph's boy. Who does he think he is? And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage when they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built with the intention of throwing him off the cliff to his death. But Jesus passed through their midst and went on his way. For those of us who are going to make a declaration that we are followers of Jesus Christ, we have to anticipate that there are going to be those who have known us who will resist or reject our decision to become a follower of Jesus. Lots of people don't have any problem with you being religious, but when you become an actual follower of Christ and begin to represent the Father and His interests in the earth, you can anticipate there's going to be some pushback. The most obvious to me is when someone within a family context becomes a follower of Jesus. And as they mature in their, their development, in their personal spiritual transformation, the way it affects their attitudes and actions and their uh, behavior toward others, the family who has known them has greater difficulty because they need you to be what they knew, not what you are becoming. And so those tensions can become very, very real, show up at holidays and in other times. But when you begin to identify as the father's representative, you also have to anticipate that he's going to require something of you. Now, in representing the father, we are charged to take stands that reflect his principles rather than what has become normal for others or had been normal for us. And sometimes that representation will require strong action. Look again at some of the things that representing the Father required of Jesus. In John chapter 2, verse 13 and following, we read that the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling auction and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables inside the temple. He made a scourge of cords, and he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. My father's house is to be a house of prayer, not a place of business. Now, in other aspects of Gospels that report this, you see that the, uh, the Pharisees, whose place of prominence and reason for being was, in fact, the temple, they come and say, by whose authority do you do this? Well, he asks a question. They can't respond, and so he doesn't respond to them either. But the point is that once you become dedicated to being your father's representative, there will be times he demands action on your part to uphold the righteousness of his part in the midst of the chaos that's all around us. This requires a substantive commitment to the Lord Jesus and our responsibility as the Lord's representatives. You can anticipate that being the Lord's representative is going to cause contention, but we have to have settled the, with some resolution in our own soul that we're willing to endure the emotional pushback, confident that our obedience to the Father will be supported by His wisdom and His grace. When we draw back from that kind of boldness, we forfeit the opportunity to be the light in the darkness that he has commanded us to become. So Jesus uh, takes quite a stir in the temple. And, you know, we hear things like, don't let the sun set on your anger out of, I believe it's uh, Ephesians. But is it ever okay to become angry? Well, Referencing Eliot's work again, I want to make this observation. Emotions must have an object, and that our evaluation of the morality of a particular emotion depends upon its object. Now, here's the thing. Without a standard, without a biblical standard 
our morality and our emotions can pick an object and become dedicated to that, whether or not it has any eternal value or kingdom perspective. And our emotions can be taken captive and inflamed towards something that has no real relevance to us as the representatives of the Father. Right now in our culture, both objects, that is what, what the object is perceived to represent in the emotions of the onlooker, and persons, specific personalities, who are perceived to represent that which the inflames the emotions of an onlooker. These objects and persons are being targeted for reprisal. The scripture makes it clear that Jesus could, like his father, be provoked to anger, which precipitated action. And here's an illustration of that out of the Gospels. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus is again in a synagogue, and there's a man there with a withered hand. Okay? And they watched Jesus to see whether he, the they is the legalists, the pharisaicals. They are watching Jesus to see whether or not he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him of breaking the rules. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come up here. And then he turned to them and he said, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? We're talking about real life versus religious rules. This is the contest here. But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out immediately. They got up out of the meeting and stormed out to take counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Now, in the story, Jesus is asking the Pharisees, is it right to do good on the Sabbath? In other words, are the rules for the Sabbath more important than caring for one another? Their unwillingness to answer is what inflamed Jesus' emotions. And he got angry because of the hardness of their heart. A righteous object of anger the hardness of heart, not the people themselves, but the attitude of their hearts. Now, the key difference, from my point of view, between the streets of our cities and the scene in the synagogue is who was Jesus representing? We have to settle whose representative we are, or we will find ourselves misrepresenting the Lord as we ignorantly attempt to represent something that's antithetical to him and to his kingdom. Now, in his humanity, Jesus was as emotional as any of the rest of us. And throughout the scripture, you'll find other examples of Jesus' emotion. For instance, there's the raising of the son of the widow in the city called Nain in Luke chapter seven, where his compassion provokes him to action. And then there's the picture of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19, because the city did not recognize the day of the visitation of God to them, the redemption being offered to them, that which he so longed for, they would refuse to receive. When you think about uh, the portrayal of Jesus in memory or in video, it's important to, re to remember that this humble Jesus, humble before the Father, bold before others, at the direction of his father, this humble servant of God took on both the political and religious structures of his day and provoked both the politicians and the religious leaders to be opposed to him because he was a threat to their ideology, their practice, and their, what we would call in our present day, following the trail of money. Because greediness and the deceit for that was prevalent both in Pontius Pilate and the Pharisees because they all had something to lose if Jesus was allowed to be revealed as who he really was. So when, when the political and religious pressers start to press in upon him, what does Jesus do? What does our model do when political pressures, pressures of political correctness, 
uh, religious uh, opposition to the reality of who you have declared yourself to be. What do you do when those pressures come bearing down upon you? Do you capitulate or do you realign? When the pressures came upon Jesus, he retreats with some of his closest companions to a place called Gethsemane. I want to revisit this to see what Jesus was actually doing there. In this drama, there were many elements pressing upon Jesus. For instance, he knew the authorities were plotting to have him killed. He also knew by revelation, one of his inner circle had already betrayed him. He knew what the call of his father was on his life, what his destiny was to die on the cross. And yet the humanity in him was craving a way of escape. As will our humanity when the pressure comes against us. The pushback comes because we made a statement, we took a stand, we acknowledged who we represent in the midst of a crowd that doesn't approve of any of this. So Jesus retreats to Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be grieved he began to be sad and sorrowful and distressed. He was distressed and almost overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the sorrow and the burden that he was carrying. Some of you may recall that in another uh, similar passage dealing with this, it said his struggle was so intense that he actually sweated large drops of blood. But he left them, he went and fell on his face, and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Don't require me to walk through the intensity of what I'm experiencing now, knowing what's coming. But, he says, not my will, but yours be done. And then he goes and finds his disciples sleeping, and so he goes back and he prays again. He says, Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, okay, is there a way for me to escape? Okay, there's no way for me to escape? Okay, how about this? Give me grace to drink from this cup because your will be done. He comes in in the, in, in the grips of, of sadness and distress in his humanity, asking for a way of escape, but your will be done. Then he comes back, okay, if I, if I can't escape it, give me grace to walk through it. He goes and checks on his disciples, they're still asleep. He comes back and he prays a third time the very same thing. And then he comes to him and says, okay, get up, it's time to go. The one who betrays me is at hand. Now. What Jesus did in Gethsemane was to reassert within himself who he represents and to realign his will and, and actions to fully fulfill what he knew his father had placed upon him. In, in that realignment, he was able with confidence and certainty to walk through what has been termed the passion. And at one point, in his engagement with Pilate. Pilate said, don't you know that I have the authority to release you? And Jesus says to him, you would have no authority over me unless it was given to you from above. And for this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. As followers of Jesus, we do not have the freedom to believe anything that pleases us. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you're not free to jump on someone else's issue related bandwagon. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you don't have the liberty 
to be driven by unbridled emotional reactions. These, these things are so typical of young people. That's why young people are so easily exploited. Look, in my seven decades, this is not the first national crisis that I'm living through. And every single one that I have seen always incites the emotion of young people to pour out in the streets, to do sit-ins, to, to, to burn flags. I mean, this is history repeating itself at a more intense level in my lifetime. But it's important to recognize that as followers of Christ, as the Father's representatives, we represent a king and his kingdom. We are the living, visible alternative to that chaos. But we're not very visible at the moment because we're still fragmented in our own thinking and our own sense of who we are and what we are to represent. But in the kingdom, every tribe, nation, and tongue are able to live together in the same spirit. We all share the same DNA. We spring from one heavenly father. The, the agenda of, of darkness is always to produce division, even among God's people. We fight over the most ridiculous things because we have not yet learned who we are to represent. We all have value because we are made in the likeness and image of God. That's why murder is so atrocious to the Father. It is the destruction of an express example of his image in the earth. We don't just belong to the church of Jesus Christ. We belong to the family of God. And as a, as a transgenerational family, we have this wonderful opportunity for the ignorant enthusiasm of youth to be tempered by the reflective wisdom and grace of the ancient. One of the reasons we, we lack cohesion as a society is we dispose of the elderly rather than drawing upon the wisdom of the ages that has been imparted through life and by revelation to them. In our local situation, we're blessed to have older and seasoned men and women of God within our constituency. And they are able, with the temperance and reflection of age, to help mitigate our emotional reactions to injustices. I recall one of my mentors when he was much, much younger. He was watching on television the public assassination of a citizen. The man was on his knees. Someone approached him from behind and shot him right in the head. He jumped to his feet and declared, I'm going to become a lawyer and fight injustice. Immediately, the Holy Spirit said, you don't think I saw that? I will render justice. That calmed him down and he went ahead and fulfilled his calling into ministry. We're capable of reacting to injustice rather than responding. If we're going to respond intelligently, we have to recognize that there's a process of uncovering the facts, looking for understanding, and then making an intelligent response rather than simply, as has been so often the case in recent months, seeing a news blast, listen to somebody spin it, and everybody's inflamed in their emotions to do something. Then as the investigation goes on, you find out the first presentation was inaccurate and the backstory tempers the entire thing, but by then it's too late. Emotional salvation is a process and it requires our allegiance to the Lord's call on us as his representatives. I want to, I want to close this particular teaching with a reminder out of the book of Colossians. And again, we have this, you've got to make up your mind as to whether or not the word of God is true for you. And if it is to govern the actions and the thought processes that control us and our emotions. Here's what Paul says in chapter three. 
Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now keep in mind, we have access to the spirit of wisdom and revelation. It is the spirit's job to reveal the deep things of the mind of God to us. There is an actual pipeline of revelation that is available to us who have been born again. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I am as subject to emotional reactions as anyone hearing the sound of my voice. And I must of necessity rule over my emotions so that I am not taken captive by them and misrepresent the wisdom and grace of the Lord. It is an ongoing challenge, but I can tell you seven decades into this journey, I'm a lot better at it than I was in my 20s. So as we look at the circumstances of life as they're being portrayed around us in this particular season, let us encourage one another. Let us remind one another of who we are as a people, who it is we represent, and what we are to display as the alternative to the chaos we see around us. I am praying and I trust with you that God would increase the measure of wisdom and revelation available to us so that when we are called upon to respond, we do so not out of our emotions, but out of the strength of the certainty and confidence and grace that is ours because we've heard from heaven and can address what's taking place from an eternal point of view. I submit this to you for your consideration. I trust that you will discuss it among yourselves. I pray that you'll look afresh at what it is the Lord is trying to bring forth in you by all these pressures. These are times that require reflection as we go to our Gethsemane because of the pressures around us to try to realign ourselves with the purposes of the Father we represent as his children. God bless you. Well, thank you, Pastor Lanny, for that message this morning. We appreciate you speaking into this season. We thank you for the, the wisdom that you have to share with us today. Well, it's time for us to head into communion now. So if you don't already have some, some communion elements together, you could prepare those now. Uh, we typically do crackers and juice over here, but you do what's going to work for you at your home today. You know, as Pastor was sharing his message, one of the, the scriptures that I think uh, you know, came out to me in particular is, um, is here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, where he, he kind of highlighted this point. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. I think that's an important thing for us to recognize that uh, that we are not our own. We've been we've been bought with a price, and and because of that, we're to glorify God because we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So there's a transformation that's taking place in us because of who and what we are now, and we have that possibility because Jesus Christ went to the cross for us. It it all came down to the cross. Jesus gave up His life and gave us life in Himself through that. And he comes back in resurrection power, giving us life to live what he has called us to. So as we come together today and considering all the things that, you know, we've, as we've been worshiping the Lord this morning in praise and worship, as we've been listening to this message that's here, considering now that all this is possible really because Jesus Christ had his body broken for us and he had his blood poured out for us so that we would have life in him, so that we could come into reconciled relationship with God, our Father, and with one another. And I think what stands out to me in that verse as well is that although we have the free will to make our own decisions and to do, um, God is not orchestrating and demanding everything that we do, but we are very much not our own mm -hmm. because he lives in us. Everything we do and everything we say is a reflection and a glorification of him. Yeah, we're here to represent re -present. Jesus and represent our Father. Mm -hmm. if, we've, 
if they've seen us, then they've seen the Father is really what it's supposed to be because we we are such a clear representation of him. That's that's the ideal. That's the goal. And thank God for the Holy Spirit who is moving us in that direction. So with that, take whatever cracker you have or bread, whatever juice, water, drink, whatever you have, and let's pray. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you bought us with a price and that you paid that with your own body and your own blood. We thank you that you have uh, you've given us your Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to make us more and more like you. Lord, we just thank you. We just come before you today and say, thank you, Lord, that you rescued us. That you came here and you rescued us. That you've rejoined us into your kingdom, into proper relationship with your Father. We thank you. We thank you for the hope that we have in us now and for where you're taking your body. Lord, come today and do a new work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take and eat and drink in the name of Jesus. Well, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to whoever's going to be able to join us tomorrow at noon. Um, but please stay safe this week with all the weather that's coming. Be safe. Uh, watch out for your friends, your family, your loved ones, your neighbors, and watch out for one another. We'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Bye-bye.
Just pray for me this side.